As you can see, hopefully on your screen, there will be a slide, the first slide of a presentation by our guest speaker, Bill Maston. Uh, the title of the talk being Tulip for Wildland EMS. EMS. We're excited to hear that. Um, it's going to be a review of wildland fire history, um, review of the past three years of wildland mechanisms of injury, and then application of wildland EMS tools to support the top MOIs. Um, I do not want to forget our faithful sponsors. Our faithful sponsors are NorCal EMS, that's us, Air Methods, PHI Air Medical, Sac Valley MedShare, and Banner Bank for making this virtual conference uh, possible. So with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker and uh, Bill Masson. I, I have a feeling many of you know Bill. Uh, he seems to know everybody. So um, maybe that's because he taught many of you. Uh, so Bill is an adjunct faculty at Shasta College, retired fire captain, paramedic with LA, fire, um, LA County Fire Department, paramedic since 1981. So he's kind of given his age away a little bit. Um, <laughs> He's worked in South Central LA, so he's seen a thing or two, I would say. Uh, he's worked as a wildland crew foreman, air operations captain, rescue task force captain, air operations branch director of an incident medical management team, and region number one fire rescue OES operations manager. And he does a lot of training. He's worked with um, Urban Search and Rescue Task Force, Swift, Swift Water Task Force. I could go on and on here. But um, he currently teaches uh, at teaches EMS and fire related classes for Shasta College and Northern Operations. Um, so it's it's really great to get to know Bill and to um, kind of I got I got to get a little sneak peek at the presentation. I think you're really going to like it. So with that, I'm introducing Bill. Thanks well, for coming. Thank you, thank you for the, the introduction and thanks uh, to everybody joining us this afternoon. Um, I think all of us here in the North State, I learned a tremendous amount coming from LA of, of uh, the remoteness of this area and how beautiful it is. But also when we go through uh, a lot of the wildland fire history, um, we're kind of at the top of the peak on that. So the TULIP for wildland EMS, uh, TULIP is a wildland term is where we gear up depending on what fuel types uh, we're going to be cutting into and through. So it's kind of like we're going to tool up our, our medical needs based on what's what's going to be thrown before us. So that's kind of where the play on words comes in. What we'll be covering is we'll go through some uh, wildland fire history, uh, the fatalities, um, injuries, illnesses, mechanism of injuries specific to the wildland community and wildland fire incidents. Um, we'll discuss a lot on the research of equipment, supplies, different packs. There's some new stuff that comes out uh, and different techniques. Um, I've had some involvement for the last 15 years with the uh, Reading Smoke Jumpers because they have a kind of a unique uh, medical scope and the Reading Hot Shot. So we've been trying to fine tune everything specific to the wildland needs. So it has a pretty good um, wilderness medical spin to it. So uh, that's kind of where all this was developed and um, where it all comes from. Now on this slide, it's an interesting slide because us here in the North State, the top 20 largest fires, and I know you can't see the names on all that, but in this, in the gray area here, that 67 years of fire history, um, is, is very small, right, piece of the pie. And then we go from 2000 to 2019, it still isn't that big when you think about it. And then in 2020 to 2021, it, it's amazing how much destruction and, and these mega fires that they're calling them now is, uh, it, it's just kind of shows us that things are not getting better and uh, things will not get better. So when we tool up, um, in these mega fires, there's lots of equipment assigned. There's lots of uh, personnel assigned. Um, and it, it's, it's good to be tooled up the right way. The next slide here, we talk about the 20 largest California fires. Uh, if you see the red X on that, the nine of those top 20 happened just in the last couple of years. 
So the largest fires, nine of the top 20 in, in, since we've been keeping history have been um, in the last two years. And also, if you look at it, uh, the majority of these are north of Sacramento. It, they're on our turf up here. So that's kind of a, those are for the largest fires. You see the August complex. And for those of you that don't know what a complex is, a bunch of fires that they roll into uh, one thing. We've got the Six Rivers Lightning Complex right now up here. Uh, is they, they're managing five separate fires as one uh, incident with uh, sharing resources. So here's the top 20 most destructive. And destructive, um, what we're referencing is the structure loss. So if we look at the campfire, which was in November 2018 in Butte County, um, 18,000 structures were lost. So if we look through that, seven of these 20, the most destructive fires have been within the last couple of years. And of those destructive fires, if we once again look, here's Butte County, uh, Shasta County, Tehama, Lassen, Plumas, they're all in the North State. So it kind of gives us a, a, a lot of times, you know, coming from Southern California, it was that Southern California was kind of like, uh, we always had these horrible fires. But if you look at the data, the biggest, most destructive uh, loss of life fires too are in north of Sacramento. They're not down south. So here's the deadliest fires. The deadliest fires, and this is uh, since they've been keeping record, two of the most deadliest fires of the 20 have been uh, in the last couple of years. There's an interesting kind of side note here. If you look at number two, and this is uh, all generated by CAL FIRE, is it's back from 1933. And a lot of people think that that was uh, loss of life, 29 fatalities that they were firefighters. And it's just kind of a side note, but it was actually just 47 acres that killed what they at the time were called uh, civilian crews. They called them 40, 40 cents an hour crew, which was part of the Great Depression to try to get people to work. Uh, so they weren't firemen. They were actually civilians that were working to improve trails and roads in uh, Griffith Park. So, um, but any of those, if you look at this, uh, particularly in the campfire, um, just within the recent uh, time, the most deadliest ones. So now we're going to talk about firefighter fatalities. Unfortunately, just... Um, the 10th of this month, a firefighter in Oregon on a crew was killed from a, a tree strike. We've also lost two uh, Chinook C-47 helicopter pilots that uh, crashed and unfortunately were killed. So we're already, those numbers are getting pushed up. And if we look at this, the 35, you guys probably recognize that in 2013, and that was uh, the 19 from Granite Mountain. Um, uh, Yarnell, the Yarnell fire. But you can kind of see how this trending is going because we've got these mega fires now. Another number that kind of helps point our compass, which way to look on uh, tooling up for medical out here is entrapments. And entrapment is defined as um, a situation where you either have to run back, uh, retreat back to your safe zone try to find shelter, shelter in place, potentially in a, a, a house that you're protecting, or actually going to full shelter deployment. So you can see the upswing here, just in these last couple of years, 15 uh, in 2020, 2021, there were 18. So it, it, it's kind of a litmus test of people getting in trouble um, because of the fire behavior. And um, I know, this extreme fire behavior, there's a video uh, that's out there, you can actually probably look it up, that came from just a couple of days ago from the Gorman fire. The Gorman fire is LA County, it's up by Highway 138 and I-5 as you come down the grapevine there. It's a perfect, perfect example of what a fire tornado looks like. And of course, we're super sensitive uh, to that up here because of the car fire and the fire NATO of an unprecedented size that overtook uh, uh, and killed Jeremy Stoke and uh, some other civilians here uh, during the car fire. So if you wanna see how a, a fire tornado 
progresses and how it builds and what it looks like, because on the ground, you really don't notice it. Um, but it's a perfect, perfect video of that. So uh, once again, it's the Gorman fire. It's called the uh, uh, LA County. It's, it's live on uh, a news feed. So what we're going to do uh, now is we're actually going to look at 2019, 2020, and 2021 to kind of see what are we going to be exposed to if, if we have inj injuries out on the fire line and uh, um, we're involved in these, these wildland incidents, how do we tool up? What, what are we going to be looking at? Are there things uh, like in South Central, when I worked in South Central, we always geared up for a lot of trauma. There was a lot of trauma going on at that time because they had gang wars going. So that was kind of always tooled up for uh, that level of, of uh, medical need. In 2019, th these facts are actually federal facts, and they are uh, taken from the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center. That's another great resource for you if you if you want to look up incidents or look at after action reports or lessons learned. That's another great resource. These are federal statistics, but we can actually interpolate it into either a city uh, jurisdiction, a county jurisdiction, or a state jurisdiction, because it's pretty much all the same dance step, if, if, if you understand my meaning there. So in 2019, there was nine fatalities, okay, nine fatalities. One was hit, this one particular fatality was a fatality uh, getting struck by a log. OK, uh, that was just the recent fatality up in Oregon with uh, the crew member that was struck by a tree. So here's the entrapment. You can see um, that six of them were during initial attacks. So people are really getting in trouble when they're rolling in, trying to institute either an anchor point or try to go uh, defensive on structure protection, point protection, as they call it. Um, so it's that initial push as we're going into the wildland incidents that uh, we're getting in trouble. And so that's something that we, sh we should always uh, be looking at. We had uh, 14 incidents of hit by tree. So if you're working an incident and there's lots of things called falling or lots of resources uh, assigned, they're called falling modules, means they're dropping lots of trees, is probably, in my opinion, from my experience, um, uh, tree fallers is the most dangerous job on the fire line, in my opinion. Um, Luke Sheehy, if you remember the MODOC incident a few years back, Luke Sheehy was a Reading smoke jumper. They jumped uh, a stick of three jumpers in on a simple one tree lightning strike up in the MODOC, and the top of the tree fell out and uh, hit Luke straight in the head and uh, uh, killed him. So, if you've got a lot of this, there's a lot of danger involved in falling trees or working around trees that uh, the area is already burnt through. So that's also something that should make your spidey senses tingle. Chainsaw cuts is customary uh, kind of down the road all the time because there's a lot of things that can go sideways with uh, chainsaws. Um, particularly with uh, what they call kickback, bigger saws have more power and torque. Um, guys get tired, they're, uh, they're beat up physically, so trying to manage a saw sometimes uh, is difficult. Vehicle rollovers uh, is another big one. We see a lot. The two, the two biggest ones, if you look at the data, are uh, water tenders, tactical water tenders, and heavy equipment that are rolling over. We're seeing a new kind of push because there's more of these ATVs on the line uh, that are, are um, rolling over and injuring people. And then of course, burn injuries. Most of these are isolated burn injuries, like from ash pits. Uh, we had an episode with chainsaws that were, uh, they were stills that were blowing out gasoline when they were trying to fuel them. So we had some burn injuries from that, but that's uh, the 2019. So we're gonna look at that in 2020 where they had 15 fatalities, uh, 15 uh, entrapments. And once again, you see here, that eight of those 15 were initial attack. Is We're getting in trouble on initial attack. Then head strikes or tree strikes, as we call them, chainsaws, the rollovers. Um, like I said, once again, it's usually water tenders. We had a fatality from a water tender down south where they rolled over. Uh, unfortunately, one of the gentlemen got killed. And then this is a hit by a rock or an object. 
if you have a lot of heavy equipment on your line, uh, nobody should be working underneath a dozer uh, because dozers kick off some big rocks and big debris. So it's uh, it's just one of these things that says, hey, th this is a danger sign, so to speak. Now in 2021, of course we had COVID. Um, so I'm not too sure how they're lining up a fatality from the wildland that they got COVID um, where they already you know, at risk, I, I'm not too sure, but they had 23 fatalities. You notice once again, we got 18 entrapments here, nine of those 18, half of them are uh, initial attack. But you also look down here, uh, nine of them were extended attack. So they got caught after they'd been out there for a while. So that's another thing to kind of take in to consideration. Uh, we have another 17 hit by trees. Um, a lot of them in non chainsaw operations is they're going through the forest and trees will just, they call them widow makers, will top out on them. The wind will blow a different direction. And the next thing you know, everything's falling down around you. Chainsaw cuts, once again, rollovers. You can see we have an ATV involved in that. There's way more ATVs involved out there on the fire line than there ever used to be. And then we had quite a few burn injuries. Like once again, they're usually um, uh, isolated, but 10 of those. Uh, of the 26 were entrapments. So they actually probably deployed in their shelters uh, and got burnt. So if we kind of boil all of this history, the mechanism down is what are those things we're looking at? And so we're looking at blood loss, bleeding control. We're looking at fractures and we'll be talking about splints and slings. Um, and when we get to that, uh, it, it's there's some new stuff out there that is good. Head strikes, and traumatic brain injury. Dehydration and rhabdomyolysis uh, is impacting the wildland community uh, extensively, which they're just now gathering data on that. We're, we'll be talking about burns and um, uh, we'll bring in the burn lecture, a lot of the, the nuggets that uh, I picked off of the burn lecture back in April. I thought that was outstanding presentation. And then we're gonna talk about regular boo-boos that are on the fire line that are just customary. So. Uh, we'll get into blood loss, bleeding control. This looks a little busy, but the triad of death is three things that, that all of us as EMS uh, providers can interrupt. We, we can help uh, mitigate acidosis, is don't let, their, don't let them get hypoxic, uh, mitigate blood loss, make sure that uh, they don't go hypotensive on us. The coagulopathy we can... Uh, have a direct impact on too, right? So the acidosis we just talked about, do not let them get hypothermic. That's another big thing, right? And everybody carries a fire shelter. We've been using the fire shelter, mongrelizing a fire shelter to help prevent hypothermia. Us as paramedics, hemal dilution is the biggest thing. You know, when I first started as a medic, it was large, two large bore IVs or ringers wide open. And uh, pretty soon your patient's bleeding Kool-Aid, right? There's another interesting thing that's happened with coagulopathy that we need to address, which you're gonna be exposed to, is chronic NSAID therapy. Um, in the military, they used to call it ranger candy. In the wildland community, I will guarantee you, if you've been out there for two weeks, you're gonna be chewing on Motrin, you're gonna be chewing on Naproxen, is because your, your body is beat up. So it's, it changes the coagulopathy of the blood. Um, this actually came out of the military because they couldn't figure out that the warriors in theater, uh, they were having so much uh, trouble trying to mitigate uh, and stem the bleeding is they were on this chronic NSAID therapy, which has another impact into rhabdo. And then the hypothermia, right? For every one degrees Celsius or basically two degrees Fahrenheit, decrease in body uh, temperature, clotting factors is decreased by 10%. So that's a huge thing that we have to be mindful of is to uh, constantly be thinking in blood loss is the triad of death. So how do we mitigate a lot of it? Well, it's been our experience, or we do, a, we test every year, both the shots and the jumpers, is every one of them carries a cat tourniquet. The SAM has, has come out with a good one. If you're using the soft tea, I'm not really a big fan of that. It's either the cat or the SAM. Uh, they seem to be more comfortable. I, I, uh, when we do our testing with the shots and the um, jumpers is they, they can 
institute a tourniquet on themselves between 20 to 28 seconds, and then they can institute a tourniquet on their partner, right, in about 20 seconds. So the faster they can get that on and get it applied correctly and stop the blood flow, it's just a win-win for their patient. So we test on that every year. Uh, on the fire line, what a lot of shot crews are doing is in faller groups is they're carrying a tourniquet, a hemostatic agent, uh, Israeli bandage, or some are carrying Curlex and Coban in a pouch on their saw chaps. So if, they're, if, if you're, you get thrown on the saw, you throw on the chaps, you automatically have a, like a self-rescue bleeding control. Because usually if you get bit by the saw, it can be minor or it can be major. So, And then let's talk about uh, hemostatic agents. We have the cytosand, right? And then we have the kaolin. So the combat gauze is the kaolin. There are two different mechanisms. Uh, a lot of people, they're steadfast on combat gauze. The kaolin is just a mineral that institutes the uh, intrinsic clotting cascade, kind of jumps in front of the line with the clotting factors and initiates the clot faster. That, that's the mechanism of the kaolin. Um, they actually use kaolin, different minerals, uh, or the kaolin mineral in winemaking. So the cytosan, in my opinion, and looking at the data, which is cell ox, this is hemcon down here, is a uh, polysaccharide. It's actually from shrimp uh, shells that this doctor invented this, and it works off a negative positive charge uh, within uh, the blood field itself. The reason I liked the cytosan better than the kaolin is the cytosan, if you're hypothermic, uh, if you're hypoxic, it does not impact the clotting cascade right? Cytosan goes straight to work it, to stem the, the bleeding. So um, these are the, the uh, ones that are on the market. I know there's a couple different uh, or newer ones that uh, have come out, but they're basically the cytosan or the kaolin. Dr. K, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's actually really interesting that the, uh, the one polysaccharide does not affect the clotting cascade. That's, that's new news to me. So thanks for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, it, also, if you're allergic to shellfish, right, it, it's a, a special shrimp in the Bering Sea that they, they mongrelize this, this chemical structure out of. Um, so if you're allergic to shrimp, it doesn't impact, you won't go into anaphylaxis for trying to control your bleeding. So another thing, uh, particularly you know, a lot of our packs, if we're engaged in the wildland community, if you got your line pack and everything, it's kind of like beachfront property down in LA, right? Is, is space is at a premium. There is this place, it's called Rescue Essentials and North American Rescue, is they will vacuum pack uh, Curlex, rolls of Curlex for you. Um, I'm a big fan of Curlex because uh, I can use Curlex to do so many different jobs, right? Wound packing, pressure dressing, uh, slings, splinting. Um, there's just so many things that I like Curlex for is they can take a full roll of Curlex, which is, you know, it can take up a lot of room in your pack and they'll vacuum pack it down. So you can carry like four rolls of Curlex where normally you might be only get one in there. So a lot of the hot shots and the uh, smoke jumpers are carrying um, this vacuum sealed stuff. Uh, of Curlex. So it's a great fit. Um, you have to kind of breathe it and, and kind of bring it back to its robust absorbency when you open that up. But uh, it's, it's a great space saving type thing. Now let's talk about uh, splints and slings. And once again, I don't have any, uh, any dog in the fight on any of these products. It's just what we found to be the best or the most convenient um, and the most um, efficient. So the Schlissman traction splint um, seems to be the industry standard now for the wildland crews. We actually, they used it uh, last month. Uh, one of the smoke jumpers, uh, they're flying a ram air parachute instead of the round one where they kind of float to the ground. The ram air parachutes, they're actually flying into the, the they're seen. So they're flying downwind, base, and final 
into their their uh, landing spot and if they lose the wind or something um they're really busy in the air trying to recapture that they had a fatality last year from a smoke jumper that lost or had a wind shift and it, it slammed him into a rock wall the redding smoke jumper he actually fractured uh, his femur in two spots they used the schlishman we do extensive training with the schlishman just because of the mechanism of injury for uh, fractured femurs. If you remember that too, with uh, Andy Palmer uh, on the fire that was out in Trinity County. Another thing that I really, really, really like about the Schlishman, and they're not that expensive if you look at it, is if I have a fractured ankle and a fractured femur, is I can use just distal to the knee as an anchor point. So I can still pull traction uh, and splint the ankle. The other thing I really like about the Schlishman is it does not extend below the bottom of the foot because it, 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 the anchor point is right there um, on the ankle itself. So if we're trying to load them up in a litter, if we're trying to load them up on a backboard, there's nothing that's sticking beyond their foot. And particularly in a wildland environment, it's just one thing less to worry about. Uh, I know many of you have probably put, uh, have used either, you know, the Sager or if you're really OG, the, the hair traction splint, is it stuck so far out, even the, the Kedrick that some people carry, is when you close those doors on the ambulance, you always double check that, that it's not extending, you know, beyond uh, where you're going to smash that thing. So the Schlishman, uh, there is a short um, Schlishman traction splint. Uh, that is just designed, you know, to, to uh, anchor just below the knee, distal to the knee. But I actually like the the longer one better. The training seems to be better. Um, and they had good results when the, the last month the jumper broke his femur. Um, another thing that uh, we do extensive training on is uh, pelvic slings. Um, when I became a paramedic, it was you used the sheet and did the wrap and all of that. Uh, we almost exclusively guys are, were tested or were training and uh, we're packing around the um, SAM pelvic sling, which we really like. And the reason we like it is it automatically kicks off. It's very reasonable. It's $70. Um, everybody gets into it so they can see what it looks like. And particularly with the mechanism of a pelvic fracture, uh, remember, we have the lateral compression. The lateral compression is where you get hit by the side and it, it breaks off this wing and shoves this over, right? The other one is the vertical shear, which you might see from falling from altitude, smoke jumpers, et cetera, is then it's, it drives this wing up. So it dis displaces uh, at the soft joint here in the symphysis and then on the soft joint on the wing. So it drives that up. And uh, then, of course, the open book. Um, the SAM splint seems to be the best. There's a new dog uh, on the block and it's called a CRO pelvic binder. Um, if, if somebody's got information, if they've used that, I have not used it. It is basically twice as much as the SAM and we train exclusively with the SAM and they, uh, the jumpers, hot shots, engine co or type three engines are carrying it now. Uh, this pelvic binder um, is supposed to be another uh, excellent pelvic binder. I, I, I don't have that much uh, experience with it, but pelvic fractures are becoming more common. Another thing we like about the, the SAM splint, that if we're not sure if the pelvis has been compromised and we're putting on the, um, the Schlishman for a fractured femur, is it's okay. To, we put on the pelvic sling first uh, and I had quizzed one of the orthopedic uh, surgeons and he, his specialty is, is pelvic fractures. So he was my sounding board and he says, no, at, by all means, put this on. Even if it's a, a fracture high up here in the greater trochanter, it still reduces uh, and, and helps support that fracture site. So we do training by installing the pelvic sling on and the Schlishman uh, both, so. There, I did learn something that was pretty interesting from this uh, orthopedic surgeon, and it's called the knees squeeze is what he uses. Of course, you have to have a responsive patient, but you just place your fists between their knees, have the patient squeeze their, your fist, 
And if it elicits pain, just assume it's fractured. It might be cracked, whatever it is. We don't have our you know, uh, x-ray glasses, but if you think it is, throw it on, all right? No different than the new DCAPS BTLS is if they complain of pelvic pain, do not do you know, the anterior, posterior, lateral, the medial uh, pelvic push on them. Just, just put the sling on and away you go. Bill, it is, uh, this is Dr. K. Um, sure. It is best to have their knees bent a little bit on that it's kind of hard for them to squeeze um, when their legs are straight. So they would bend their knees first up and then try to squeeze. Uh, not necessarily. Um, the way we do is their, their legs are out. And once I put my fists like this in between them, they just squeeze. It's on the, the uh, lateral sides of both. It's just squeeze my fists like this, bing, bing. Um, and if it elicits pain, uh, is we, we throw the sling on. Did that answer your question a little bit? Oh, yeah. I was saying in general, it's a little bit uh, more sensitive if you bend the knees uh, a little bit. Okay. It isolates the muscles in the pelvis a little bit better. But okay. but it sounds like you've had success with the leg straight as well. So. Well, but that we, it, we're always open for, you know, doing a, a little bit better. So probably if I, if I knew I didn't have any leg involvement, I might have them slightly bend their knees a little bit, throw something under there and then have them squeeze it. So like you said, it would isolate the pelvic region better. It, it does a, help a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes well, you know what I'll do, Dr. K is I, I, we will actually try that uh, next fire season. We'll, we'll throw that into the training. That's a good idea. So the next one is uh, head strikes and traumatic brain injury. Just like uh, the triad of death, uh, us as providers, as clinicians out on wildland uh, incidents can have a profound difference on the outcome of a lot of these head strikes. And particularly for, like I said, if you have a lot of fallers out there, you, um, there's going to be a higher probability of a head strike. Or if crews are walking through a lot of a, the unburnt area to try to get to uh, their, their anchor point to start to work is, uh, trees just fall over like magic it, limbs fall out of trees. So it's something to kind of keep, uh, in the back of your head. The goal, uh, is to make every effort to, to keep cerebral perfusion and blood flow. So do not let them get hypoxic an episode of hypoxia. And this is from, um, the ATLS and Brain Trauma Foundation. It says one episode of hypoxia can increase mortality by as much as 50%. So we can have a direct impact on that. Now, another thing, particularly in the wildland community, um, at the college, we teach a, a 223 class, a fireline medic, fireline EMT class. And we're trying to make it that they carry a RAD 57 so they can do a carboxyhemoglobin. I know that's a little expensive. Some of you might have it, some of you might not. But the nice thing about that is I won't get a false positive if they've, if they've been satted with carbon monoxide um, because of an inversion on the fire or they're just all smoked up real bad. Because I won't, the, my glucon or my uh, pulse oximeter is not gonna give me a good read, right? If they're hypothermic, hypovolemic, or uh, they've been exposed to products of combustion, it's going to give me a bum reading. And that's why we, we try to use the RAD 57, um, which will give me a carboxyhemoglobin also. So uh, when we want to have their uh, um, PACO2 between normal limits, do not let them get hypotensive. A 30 degree position, if we're going to carry them out, is try to keep them 30 degrees uh, head high. Uh, also neutral neck and the C collar, if you can get away without applying a C collar or put it on loosely, they found that that uh, C collars are compressing the, uh, the venous return from the jugular veins uh, back to the heart. So, and we also want to keep them normal tensive. So those are, th those are things that we can impact uh, readily in the field. Uh, head strikes are very common in the field. So um, something to be looking at. Now, dehydration and rhabdomyolysis, um, the wildland community uh, is just actually kind of now catching up to this, I think. We, we've seen this trending over the last maybe four or five years where guys are going down. Um, I did not know what rhabdo was. When I went through paramedic school in 81, it was never mentioned. 
when we had the earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake, uh, and the gentleman died from the 880 uh, collapse, the smiling death, as they called it, I did not, we didn't deal with compartment syndrome or crush injury. It was not even on our radar, right? In, in reality, it all came out of World War II in London, but um, rhabdo now is very, very common uh, in the wildland community. They've had 19 confirmed cases of it, uh, but there's a whole bunch of cases that did not get uh, put into the data. So some of the signs and symptoms, muscle pain, cramping. This muscle pain, I've had uh, people that have suffered from rhabdo say it's a different type of muscle pain. It's like this real deep aching muscle pain that's not like over stressing uh, one of your muscles. It's different, they, they talk about. Uh, they lose range of motion. What some, what they did last year, this is actually kind of interesting. We always, we know rhabdo and we, you know, we check their urine. Uh, in the wildland community, we're actually carrying one of those uh, one quart um, U.S. Forest Service, uh, kind of a opaque looking water bottle as like a port of john uh, that if they need it is to keep track, uh, if we needed to keep track of urine output because of like the parkland burn formula for the smoke jumpers and their IV therapy and stuff, but they're actually carrying, um, uh, test strips for urinalysis. So they're actually sticking the urine, um, and seeing if it's showing blood, if it's testing positive for blood, um, is this just one more sign that says, hey, you got to go in, pal. You need to get off the line and you need to go checked out. Now, the rebound from rhabdo is not like overnight. You don't get sent to the hospital. They give you 5,000 milliliters of fluid and you suit back up and go on the line. There's They got to get that, that CPK level way back down and test you all the time. So if you do suffer from rhabdo, um, it, it's, it's not, you, you throw it back on your Superman cape and, uh, hit the line that that's not the way it works. Um, Dr. Katie, have anything to add to that one? Yeah. The only thing, uh, I wanted to add maybe is I, I'm pretty sure, and I'm going to have to go back to my textbook or anybody could do a Google search in a second and find out, but I think it, the reason that it's, uh, a positive blood is not because it's blood, but it's myoglobin. Yeah, and okay, my, yes. myoglobin is the breakdown product of the muscle, but it cross reacts with the hemoglobin. Uh, and so I'm pretty sure that's why it's dark and positive on the blood, but it's not truly blood. Correct. Yes. It, um, the broken down components of muscle. Correct. Yeah, the, the, the muscle cells regurgitate myoglobin, and that, that's one of the things that they worry about uh, getting backed up into the kidneys, you know, the delicate kidneys. So that's, that's a good point. I should have mentioned that. But it's just another thing to help you uh, kind of uh, delineate, hey, this guy needs to go in or this, this uh, person needs to go in. So the, the dehydration and rhabdo is caused by overexertion, poor conditioning, um, all these things you can see here, dehydration, uh, also prescription of uh, statins and antidepressants, a lot of antihistamines can change it. Here's the NSAIDs again, okay? So NSAIDs are on chronic NSAID therapy, just like the triad of death, and we talked about the coagulopathy, it's, it shows back up here. Now what they're finding out is an excessive caffeine intake or a history of pre-workout supplements and energy drink abuse. It's not, um, I had somebody get mad at me when I brought this up one time. They, it's it's not now and then. It's it, it's an abuse of energy drinks and these pre workout supplements. Um, so those things will predispose you to rhabdo. What they've found is pre season guys are trying to use these pre workout supplements and energy drinks to cut corners on coming in shape. So uh, it, it's forbidden in a lot of uh, different agencies. Now, the, this hydration strategy actually comes from the military model and it's two waters, whatever unit you're using, is it's court canteen, whatever it is, it's two, whatever you're drinking, units of water, and then one of those units of the hydration solution. Um, years, it was probably about five years now, we, we were doing drip drop 
like crazy. Drip Dop actually came from a doctor that, that invented it when he came back from a typhoid outbreak in Guatemala. He was a Doctors Without Borders. He says, we got to do better because they were losing these kids and they didn't have enough IVs. So that's, he designed this to help as an oral rehydration solution. Um, it's, it's been proven the military jumped all over this too. There's other ones. Um, I, I believe Redding carries drip drop, LA County carries drip drop. There's Sarah Sport. There's this other one, Power Pack. Some people carry lip. It, this is whatever your flavor is, but you have to kind of look at the ingredients. The liquid IV. We tried this Pedialyte. Pedialyte came out with one. And this is one nasty drink. It, it was like, ugh. I, we were doing a little test uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, if you had to drink that, it, it, it's not good. Uh, Cal Fire, a lot of other agencies in the North State here are going to scratch. Um, so if you have any uh, experience with that, if you can uh, uh, push that forward, that would be helpful. We just, we just throw these up there. Now, I know there's a whole bunch more, right? And particularly if you're like one of these advanced athletes and stuff. These are just the ones it seems like everybody's carrying. I know the drip drop has been... Um, uh, kind of steadfast for the smoke jumpers and the hot shots and other uh, strike team, engine strike teams that go out that they says, no, it, it, it's been proven to help. Yeah. Hey, Bill, just a, a side note on this. These are great to bring up because um, because these do work and do help with a hydration strategy. The number one response of uh, that we've seen among, because uh, I work for a, a company that goes out and takes care of firefighters at fire camps is the overuse um, <laughs> and creating even hypertonic solutions. So it's one of those too much of a good thing. Well, if it works, well, then I'm going to get really hydrated. And, uh, and then sometimes our kidneys stop working. So we have seen that with drip drop in particular when it was just very much of a fad. That's correct. Too much drip drop. So you got to use it um, per the instructions. The other thing is using just free water to begin with is, is really probably a good thing to prevent overuse of these um, isotonic solutions. So, um, you know, you can drink a couple liters of just plain water and that's fine. And then it starts to be too much free water after, after that. And then these hydration um, strategies with, with uh, isotonic and electrolyte solutions are actually really helpful after that one to two liters. It's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and I think the other thing, that's a good point, Dr. K, is in, in LA, when I ran hand crews, is we prehydrated. actually it was a study from the Israeli army of why they won the six day war with Syria, was they prehydrated their troops and had a hydration strategy during the battle. So uh, that worked really well as prehydrate, knowing we're gonna jump a couple of fires to, to that day, so. Also, let's get in. We'll talk about thermal burns. Um, once again, if you want to see that fire uh, NATO, uh, go to YouTube and, and pick it up because it's, it, when I watch it, it was from a live uh, Channel 5 camera feed. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is perfect. It, it, it will really show you the mechanics of it. So everybody's pretty up to date on this. Um, once again, uh, I really appreciate, appreciated Dr. Stacy Rhoda as, as a burn specialist and her um, presentation in April and uh, the 20% or greater thing, the body changes. So a 20% or greater burn is a, a different story, which I really took to heart. We all know about the five critical burns. So I don't think we need to do that. Um, make sure we cover and protect them. She did uh, mention that water gel, the burn gel is okay for smaller burns. And it's been my experience on the wildland stuff is you'll suffer these minor burns, you know, back of the hand, the elbow, whatever it is, um, uh, a, a part of your thigh from a hot muffler or something, is it's okay to use those. And I, I've, I think that, you know, before it was, I never use that stuff, but I think it's okay. The other big thing is, it's, is they need to go straight to the burn center, period. She also had mentioned uh, that an IV infusion is better than a bolus, which I thought was extremely interesting. And then get a real, real good detailed history and mechanism of injury. So the burn specialist can use that. You know, how long were they exposed? What was the atmosphere like? 
what materials were burning, et cetera, how long were their, their clothing on them, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because a lot of the web gear might fail. So here's routine boo-boos. Um, there's, there's a new thing out on the market. It's just a 30 milliliter normal saline, which um, instead of carrying the bottles or carrying, you know, a 250 bag or whatever you're carrying, these are just 30 milliliters, right? So they're so easy. Plus you can warm them up quicker that if I need to irrigate my eyes, instead of having ice cold saline or something, a, a warm saline solution is easier. And these are real good for eye irrigation because if you're running the saw or, or stuff gets in your eyes all the time, uh, your nose to irrigate your nose because um, pretty soon uh, it's, it's just full of boogers, right? Is <laughs> I need to irrigate my nose. And then obviously for wound irrigation, they this little pack here has this derma bond, which is like a pen. It's not a glue, it's a polymer that reacts and plastic surgeons are using this. This isn't that expensive. And a lot of times they'll get, it's called a tool skip is you'll get just a, a, a small laceration on your shin or your calf or something. So they've put together this vacuum pack. There's some two by twos, some Dermabond and two 30 milliliter normal salines to irrigate it, patch it up. This will sustain for up to uh, seven days. Uh, they're also carrying, they're modifying, instead of buying the rhino rocket for nosebleeds because you get banged in the face all the time, is they're just modifying uh, feminine uh, tampons, which is a, is a perfect fit. It's just a great way to help mitigate a nosebleed. So we're gonna talk about some wildland packs. Uh, they're different than what you might use as a city pack, you know, going into a house or into the mall or something on a, on a call. These are all wildland tested packs. Uh, 511 Tactical has a real nice pack. Uh, the, there were some agencies that were using that. Uh, it's all modular in there. It's a great pack. It's a great pack to work out of. They it has also the ability to carry a, a, a fire shelter with you. There's a, this uh, pack shack, there's a new uh, company on town for the last couple of years. It's called Mystery Ranch. They're out of Bozeman, Montana. They look a little pricey, but these are probably the finest packs you'll see. They do a lot of military uh, uh, development too. So this is 520. You can see there's fire shelter under here. This is, a, this is another one. They're all modular. You know, you can build into them and out. This is called a 10-man pack. Uh, on hand crews, each mod, which is 10 people, every mod carries what they call a 10-man pack. It's a 10-man medical pack. This one from Mystery Ranch, I bought one just to run through it. In this right here, there's five normal salines, two cat tourniquets, six rolls of full Curlex, four rolls of Coban. Um, so that's just in this pack right here that also will marry into the Mystery Ranch wildland fire gear. Uh, for the females that are going out there, Mystery Ranch developed a female-based and designed set of web gear for your frames and your uh, special body types instead of having to try to wear some man's, you know, something that was built for a man. So. Uh, they just came out with that this year. So Mystery Ranch is kind of the new dogs on the pack. Uh, we did the test, like once again, this S223 class um, at the Shasta College, if you're interested in taking that, it's, it's two days, 16 hours, is we did the True North pack, which is modular. This is all set up with all the BLS inventory from uh, the FireScope uh, Fireline EMT Fireline Medic. You're paired up, right, a Medic with an EMT. So this is all the BLS gear that we carried around just to test it. There's some new shears out there. These Leatherman Raptors are really pricey. We, we haven't had good luck with these little, you know, these little $10 ones that people buy all the time. The new one is this X shear, and X shear has come out. Um, they seem to be really robust. We can cut through webbing. Uh, they stay sharp. They're just, they seem like a better scissor. They're not real cheap, but they're not real expensive either. The Raptor is kind of like a, it has a bunch of other things, right? This is a, a, a seatbelt cutter. You can turn on an O2 bottle, all this other stuff, but there's a window breaker. But these are like a genie in a bottle. Once you get them open to try to collapse them all back down and put them in their little holder, sometimes you just throw them back in your pocket. So... And then we'll talk about wildland litters. 
the everybody you'll see a lot of wilderness wheels this is a two-piece stainless steel uh litter this can be actually pair of cargo these are uh redding smoke jumpers we're doing an evolution here out at um uh, a remote area in Shasta, Shasta County, is they can actually pair a cargo of this and deliver it to you from the air if, if you need a litter. They have two litters. You'll also see a lot of these extraction litters. This kind of came about out of the military. These are just rapid extraction litters is all they are um, that uh, are rolled up and uh, one of the guy on the crew usually carries it. You'll see a lot of these. This is called a TRS, a transverse rescue stretcher. I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, we used to use these in confined space to get people out of silos and stuff like that. This is not good to take to a helicopter because it, it acts like a weather vane. It will start spinning uncontrollably if you don't tagline them out. And then if you use that, you need this thing called a Bauman bag. This is this TRS is extremely uncomfortable. They'll hypoventilate because they're strapped into this thing. It is not C-spine. It has to be incorporated with a half board, like an Oregon spine board or the KED. Wildland guys can MacGyver anything. We've used, this is one of the fire shelters that we use webbing on and uh, hiked them out over half a mile without that ripping. The key was to roll the sides up real tight, as tight as you can get them cut a little slit in the, the uh, shelter and then lay something underneath it. These are smoke jumpers uh, carrying somebody out that is using parachute and paracord uh, and slings. So they incorporate it into their web gear. If you ask them to help or MacGyver them out, they'll do it for you. These are smoke jumpers that actually built Travois. We went a mile with a burn victim. This is a training. This is a burn victim that they built this Travoy, which is a Native American device. Uh, the, the Native Americans, the hunter gatherers used it. The horses would pull it, people would pull it. They even had Travois for their dogs. The dogs would pull it. So it just reduces the fatigue on people trying to tend the litter and you can yoke somebody out and make pretty really good time actually. So that's just another MacGyver. This is, uh, uh, this is available. These are just some sites that if you want to research this equipment, Chinook Medical will actually make your own module for you. You tell them what they want. They'll vacuum pack it together for you and mail it to you. Um, this Vitality Medical for Curlex Coban and stuff like that seems to be the best price on the market. Um, and we use, I use them exclusively because we go through a ton of Curlex and Coban in training. Um, there's two things. Uh, this is a free phone app. It's called Watch Duty. This is the McKinney Fire that uh, is up north of us. And then there's a Wilderness Environmental Medicine. If I, this is a, we use this as a reference book. It's a great, great book uh, for res reference material for wildland medical, and it's updated every year. And I know Dr. K used to be part of uh, that organization. Dr. K, if you'd like to speak on that. Yeah, well, the book is pretty much epic in the field of uh, wilderness medicine. Uh, it's the thick textbook, but it's a great reference. Um, you're not gonna you're, <laughs> you're not gonna read it at night; it may put you to sleep. But there's some stuff that's really, really cool in there, and it is updated. But um, but then there is also a treatment guideline. If you go onto Wilderness Medical Society site, they and you become you sign in and create an account, you can look at their. Um, some of their merchandise and they do have like treatment guidelines boiled down. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, great society and a great textbook. And, it, and it's, it's a great fit. Uh, we kind of use that as our foundation uh, 15 years ago when we were building the wildland uh, medical training for, you know, we, we adhere to title 22, but the, the finer techniques and the finer understanding came from the wilderness medical society versus you know title 22 and, and stuff like that it was just a better fit for the wildland long-term patient care needs etc so um and then that's it if uh there was any questions uh i think this uh it, I, I hope it helped you uh, a little bit to know which way to point your compass if there's i hope there's enough good resources in there to allow you to um if you want to experiment with some of this equipment um or research it further um I hope there's enough uh, information there to provide that for you. 
Well, have a safe one. I hope uh, wish everybody health and happiness out there and be careful.